everybody, kumusta kayo lahat? Welcome to Pinoy Crossover, the basketball show for the Filipino community. My name is PJ, joining me, my co-host Marky Mark right there. We got JR, and then we got the legend, the miss, the myth that everyone was talking about. All our people that come to the show <laughs> mention his name, Dean Labay. And Dean, thank you for being here. And we're excited because we're going to ask him about his journey and his basketball life. He went to the Philippines to play basketball. He also was a top level you know basketball player at york university so let's just dive into it tell us about your inspiration or what made you start playing basketball um I, my first basketball memory was my mom buying me a basketball that's that's how it began it just she bought me a basketball i instantly fell in love with it and i took it everywhere i went um but the my real what really got me into it when I really think about what really brought me into the game was really my parents splitting up. That basketball became my, my escape. I'd find myself on a court, my parents would fight, I'd go outside and play basketball. Yeah. Hours and hours and hours later, come back, and the shouting would stop. Mm -hmm. It just became something that became a mental escape for me. Yeah. And I ended up putting hours and hours and hours into it. And then I, I guess that's part of how it just became a part of like who I am. Mm -hmm. It's probably, mm -hmm. that was probably the start for it. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on to, so you played high school. Where did you play high school? And then, and then like university days. Yeah, like what people don't understand, like, most people who've met me through the Filipino community, mm -hmm. their story with me starts around 15 or 16 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I didn't know another Filipino human until I was about 15 or 16 outside of my family. Mm -hmm. Like that's like yeah. we we grew up in Rexdale in an all black neighborhood and I didn't really know what I was. Like mm -hmm. culturally I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And I was playing in the the circuit, the you know, they call it ghetto ball mm -hmm. and I'd be playing in that circuit. Uh, the and once somebody just found me, a Filipino um, coach saw me playing and he asked me to try out for his team. I had no idea what that meant mm -hmm. and uh, ended up playing for his team. And um, that kind of brought me into that Filipino community. So that was around 15 or 16. But I had been playing, my first high school was, was West Humber in the West End, in the heart of Rexdale. And then I ended up graduating out of Scarborough at Mother Teresa. And mm -hmm. if you know Mother Teresa, has, it's a big Filipino community out there in Scarborough. So, yeah. you know, then I was already through my connections. I was actually living with the coach who, who oh. discovered me yeah. um, with him for my final uh, year of, of high school. Yeah. Right, so. And what was your decision of, you know, going to, uh, well, after you graduated high school, going to York University? Um, would you study? Yeah. Um, that, uh, like uh, you'll hear a lot of my stories that they were unplanned you know <laughs> like I was never planning on going to New York it just wasn't a thing you mm -hmm. know I I wasn't even thinking about going to university mm -hmm. I just it wasn't something that anybody I knew was pursuing mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. nobody on my basketball team went to university it wasn't things we talked about but my guidance counselor she looked at my marks and she said you are not allowed to leave my office until you apply to universities. You have great marks. Mm -hmm. you know, I did my work, I did, you know, I went mm -hmm. to school, I did play basketball, I did my work. And she said, you're not allowed to leave. So I applied and I got into York, McMaster, U of T, and I got into all the schools I applied. But my heart was set on an American university. You know, mm -hmm. that's what my friends were talking about. You know, I thought Duke, Clemson, UNLV were, <laughs> I had no idea what, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. But those were the things that people were talking about. They were saying Division One scholarship, blah, blah, blah. And when that didn't happen, uh, I just, I ended up going where my friends were going. My girlfriend at the time was at York. Mm -hmm. Stayed home, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But um, uh, that was it. You know, there, there was a strike in high school that went through our senior season, which would be your recruiting season yeah. mm. and that in the Catholic school board that strike meant 
nobody got to see you play. It's not like YouTube now where you can just make a tape yeah. and show highlights. People had to see you in person. So for that recruiting portion of the year, nobody saw you. So yeah. the, the chances of you going to a university in the States were very slim unless you could, you could be seen playing. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to York. But um, people, people knew, like people in Toronto knew. I, even that year I was still like a Metro All-Star, you know, like considered one of the 12 best players in the city. So within the local community, they, they knew who played ball, but nobody outside could recruit you because mm -hmm. they didn't see you. And going back to the Filipino roots, like when you were in high school, the Filipinos were at Mother Teresa, and you were probably playing the Filipino circuit too. How yeah. was that experience like, I guess, being, a, being around the Filipino circuit and then playing in Mother Teresa, one of the best schools? I'm pretty sure you had some support from Filipinos or just from people around the, the area too. Yeah, it, it was just, it was nice to, uh, uh, at that point I started to identify more with the community, with what it meant to be Filipino, and really just try to embrace what that meant. You know, now I'm representing someone more than myself and representing more than just a community and representing, you know, people. And, uh, you know, anything I would do would be a reflection of, of my culture. My culture. Mm -hmm. And so it started, it, that, that was, it did start to push me. You know, it was, I was getting a lot of support from the community and it was important for me at that point just to kind of represent as best as I could. Mm -hmm. when, when you were playing, like, you know, when you, were, when you started playing, when did you kind of realize that you were like, damn, I'm actually really <laughs> I'm good. good and like, <laughs> I'm actually better than most of the people that I play with. When yeah. did you kind of notice that? I'm pretty sure you have a vivid memory of that. Uh, yeah, there was, a, you know, like I said, like I never really, like I, I played, um, I have a picture of my grade eight basketball team. On it was a six foot eight, we had a six foot eight kid, a six foot six person. We had a guy who was five foot six that could dunk a 10 foot rim. These were the guys I grew up with. That felt normal to me. Mm. <laughs> I, I never felt like, like that was the norm to be surrounded by really athletic guys. So I never felt like I was good. Mm. I felt like I was always chasing guys that were more athletic, guys that were better. Mm -hmm. So it really came, came later because it really was maybe not until I started to get recognized in, in like we had grade 13, so I'm, I'm part of I'm that old. So 12 and 13 when um, some of the older guys that I looked up to started to, to move on and graduate that you started to separate yourself from everybody else. It was like, okay, well, all the older guys graduate, who's next? Mm -hmm. Who's next? Then I started making, you know, the OBA, the OBA teams, the, you know, provincial programs, you started to make the Toronto All-Stars and you really started to separate yourself from like anybody else who just played regular leagues or, 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 your, or your high school circuit. Mm -hmm. But I would say it came late, not until grade 12, grade 13. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then once you were in York University, just so everyone knows, you became a CIS all-star, like a Filipino, an Asian, let's just say Asian, <laughs> yeah. made it as an all-star in the whole of the collegiate, you know, Canadian collegiate basketball sports. So could you talk about like that, that's, or just your years at York University proving yourself to be a top Canadian player, not only Filipino, just Canadian player? Yeah, um, that question, when that comes up, mm. I always think of it in a way, uh, I never really wanted to be the best Filipino player. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's not where my mindset would. It was be the best of anybody. Yeah. Of who, of, and, and that's the way I thought about it. If I'm gonna play against, I don't care what color you were, but if we're gonna go on the court together, I wanted to be the best at what, regardless of, of what your demographic was. So I took, always took that into anything I did. So there, being recognized, um, it, it was big. Like I realized what that would mean for for myself, and I realized what it would mean maybe for like the bigger picture because it was for the first time in the country they were seeing something other than what was familiar to them. You know, 
basketball in this country is basically black and white, mm -hmm. but it's never been Asian. Yeah. And it's not like that anymore, mm -hmm. right? So um, it, in terms of how I approach that, um, I just wanted to be the best, you know, like regardless. Was there any memory or a game that stood out in your mind that, that really cemented you as like the, the CIS Rookie of the Year or like anything that comes to mind, a shot or a game that really proved? Uh, we played, you know, like all young, I, I guess, first year players. You know, you, you overestimate your abilities or, or you just underestimate the abilities of who you're playing. But we were playing a ranked team and we had no idea we were playing Concordia. It was ranked six in the country. We had no idea we were, we were young. And, and again, I just, I just went at them. I just didn't give them the respect of being ranked. And we, we just went at them in, in Montreal. And we ended up, well, people called it an upset. And I was just like, we just, we're just better than you, <laughs> right? I was like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had, I must have had, I'm going to guess, 37 points. And I didn't play the, like, the whole second half of, right? I was, I was just really, I was on fire. I had like eight threes in, in the first half. And then coach said, he, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't even, I was, coach, I want to go for 40. He wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> just the last 10 minutes of the game, you wouldn't even play me. I, and I'm still upset about that. <laughs> Now, being the CIS, was that kind of the like the propulsion to go to the Philippines to meet, or like how everything ties up? Is that how did you end up getting the opportunity to go to the Philippines? Right. So that would have been the catalyst. Yeah. Because then people started to hear there's a Filipino kid with national recognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started to get phone calls from agents I didn't know and people who I didn't know who are saying, I can create an opportunity for you, you can be rich, you can have a career playing basketball in the Philippines, which was never on my radar. But it was started to pique my interest. Um, so at the end of that year, all I craved was, now that I have this award, you also have the weight of carrying the <laughs> yeah. burden of you know, repeat it, to re repeat that sort of success for mm -hmm. not only for yourself, but for your team. Yeah. And I wanted to find the best opportunity for myself to continue to develop. Mm -hmm. My options were stay at home for four months, train on my own, go to the Philippines and play. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'll go to the Philippines. Mm 